I want a divorce. Do you hear, Marco? I want a divorce! Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, it is a Saturday night. Maybe if you listen to podcasts on Saturday, I don't much, but I'm here uh, with Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello, Richard. How are you? I am great. I am totally not confused about what day it is, but that's my comedy jokes. I don't know. So, Mark, you know, this is your first time on the show. Welcome. I'm so excited, Richard. You have zero idea how excited I am to be talking with you. Well, I am palpably excited to talk to you as well. And so I sent you a a request of, hey, Mark, send me a big list of movies and I'll pick something from your list that you're excited to talk about. And you happily provided me with a list. A plethora. It was a it was a, a large grab bag of amazing titles, but since uh, Giallo Meltdown Two, the sequel to Giallo Meltdown: Colon, a movie thon diary, is now available at Amazon.com. The people don't know that uh, Jeff Bezos prefers that you emphasize the dot in dot com. Since the book is out, I said let's do a Giallo, and one of the Giallo suggestions you'd made was Smile Before Death. Which, which is amazing. It is, it is not a prequel to Death Before Dishonor. That is a totally different movie, unrelated. But this is directed by uh, um, Silvio Amadio, or if you're me, who can't edit his own book, in Giallo Meltdown, the first book, I have it as Amado with no I at the end. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this is what happens when you have no budget and you don't want to impose on people to edit your book. So you just kind of like have mistakes like Silvio Amado. <laughs> it's just it's just a gift to have the books, Richard. So don't oh, be hard on yourself. Thank you. It's like Silvio. I don't know him. But we're, <laughs> we're, yeah, we're talking Smile Before Death, 1972, a.k.a. the translated Italian titles, The Hyena's Smile. I Which wish I had a little doggy giggle. I know. Yes, a, a laughing hyena or something to drop in. <laughs> I'm sure I could find one. I'm sure I'm sure uh, the YouTube would provide me with that. Uh, but this is written by Silvio Amadio and his pals Francesco Di Dio. And then another Francesco, Francesco Villa. Now, I love trailers. But this movie has no trailer. And if it did, typical Italian giallo trailer would probably be three minutes long show the good stuff and it would be in italian with the the song i know you know it song oh yes the song yeah and it would never get out of your head (laughs) so instead of a trailer i'm gonna play a little bit of that song and just totally (gasps) break all the copyright laws so when this episode's on youtube hopefully uh the the composer uh, roberto pergadio hopefully his uh his children or family or whatever are kind and don't force people to take the stuff down. So yeah, here's that song. So what were you saying? I was going to say, while it's playing, I would hope that the audience listening would kind of picture me in a different, like, montage of outfits and wigs <laughs> see you're very good at dressing <clears> up <throat> whereas when i dress up 
It's just, you know, a plaid shirt, some slacks, New Balance sneakers, you know. But, hey, I'll wear yeah. different colors of plaid. I'll get funky. Oh. <laughs> it, it's amazing how much you can dress plaid up with just a, a scarf. <laughs> I have, like, one scarf. I need to have my game. <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah. before we continue, folks, we're going to spoil this movie. We're going to not do every scene. We're going to do a selection of key scenes, but we are absolutely going to talk about the ending of Smile Before Death. And if you haven't seen it, you should you should absolutely check it out. I don't even think us spoiling it could ruin all the fun. Exactly. There, there's, there's stuff in this movie that is, it's not like a traditional black-gloved killer giallo where, you know, it's like 13 victims. And in the last minute, we find out that it was the priest or it was uh, the priest, but he wasn't really a priest. You know, that one, that, that cop out was always funny to me. But right. this is absolutely a jet setting, fancy people behaving badly. So upper, upper class or wannabe upper class people behaving badly, which was a whole subgenre unto itself in the Giallo. What, they, what were they calling it? Cosmopolitan? That's a great word for it. I don't know. I, I don't know if that, that might be, even be the official. All, all I know is that these rich people got problems. Uh, mo money, mo problems. Exactly. Totally. It's hard to be wealthy. Right? And good yeah, looking. you and I. Same. Yes. Same. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. If you hear the sound, it's it's us patting ourselves on the back. That's what that sound is <laughs> right there. Uh, but the cast, let's talk about this cast. we got Jenny Tamburi, which sounds like a delicious food. <laughs> I would order Jenny Tamburi at every restaurant. So she was in The Psychic and uh, The Suspicious Death of a Minor. For some reason, she's not credited on this film as Jenny Tamburi. Uh, she's credited as Luciana Della. No, I have to open the screen to view. Come on. There it is. Luciana Della Rabia. Um, there was some confusion. Um, there's an interview with Silvio Amadio's son. And he just mentions that they changed her name, even though she was already sort of an established actress. No idea what happened. Well, and she was only like 19 when she did this film. Like this wasn't her first film though. She's No, she's but she was just so, she was so young. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh yeah. God, this is only a third thing. Okay. So yeah, maybe they just didn't know who she was yet. I like her. She's a very unusual looking young lady. She's not your typical Giallo starlet. I mean, she's lovely, but she just has a look about her that's very different. To me, like, well, we're spoiling this. So the, the movie is pretty nudity heavy, I would say, yeah, for her character. But there's something about her that she pulls this off without it coming off as super sleazy to me. Yeah. Her look, I don't know. There's something about, like, she's kind of like that girl next door. Like, so it's it doesn't come off as, like, super like pervy or anything. Yeah. You think she's innocent. Right. <laughs> right. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Next up, we got a good old uh, Silviano Tranquilli, who is all over the freaking uh, giallo genre. I'm trying to think of what I know him best from. He's just 112 credits. Oh man. I love this guy. Dude. He's very dashing. Absolutely. Especially when he's chasing those young ladies. <laughs> he's quite the jet setter. Oh, yeah, it was in one of my least favorites. He was in, uh, it's called My Wife, A Body to Love, but I saw it as My Wife Has a Body to Die For. And I was like, um, I definitely like his other film, uh, So Sweet, So Dead, a lot more, which mm -hmm. uh, I recently rewatched that, and I was like, wow, <laughs> not a lot of laughs in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so Sweet, So Dead takes itself very seriously. Just like uh, another movie he did called The Bloodstained Butterfly, which I have not seen in years. I remember liking that one. I remember seeing it. I'd have to like <laughs> look at I have to look at Giallo Meltdown and see what in the world I thought about it. But then again, my my problem with the first Giallo Meltdown book was I kept not saying if I liked a movie or not. I would just talk about what happened in it and then move on. And so I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I didn't leave myself any clues, but I'll just rewatch it. And I remember course. I've seen a butterfly one time, so yeah, that counts. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. That's it. I, I definitely heard about a murder once. Right, right. 
So up next is Rosalba Neri, um, a lady oh. who needs no introduction, even though, you know, I just, I'm just giving her one. Ever since I saw on a little cheapo DVD horror compilation, a little film called Lady Frankenstein, I was in love with Rosalba Neri. Same here, except mine was like on late night TV. They showed it uh, on my local TV channel. That is too cool. It was amazing. I've seen movies where I didn't like the movie with her, but she's always good. She is. She's very consistent. She always gives strong performances. I, I And she's like fascinating to look at. Totally. She's got that. She's got a moment in this movie that blew me away. Like even after seeing, you know, 10, 12, 15 movies with her, there's <laughs> still a moment in this movie where her performance blew me away away, like all the way away. Then we got uh, Hiram Keller, um, who uh, he played, uh, he plays a credited character named Dorothy's Lover. Hiram Keller, um, according to the trivia, he was actually carved out of stone. Um, (laughs) The first time I ever saw him was years ago, uh, Fellini's Satyricon, of course. But um, you know what? He didn't do as much as I thought he did. No, apparently at the time he was supposed to be like a big get, but his star trajectory didn't quite take off the way they thought it was going to. Well, I absolutely adore him in Seven Deaths and the Cat's Eyes. Yes. Wow. What a movie. Um, I love, I think that one is underappreciated by Giallo fans. <laughs> you know, I love that one too. So good. Uh, then we got uh, Dana Gia. Dana Gia, I'm not sure how to say that last name. Oh, man, My Dear Killer, Nuff Said. I, I love, I love this lady. She's always just playing a very, um, I don't want to say plain. She, she always plays a character that seems very um, plain. <laughs> I, think of it. I can't, uh, she always plays a mother. She always plays uh, someone who's like uh, very reserved. Oh, there's the word I was looking for. Freaking reserved, yeah. She was yes. also a, the bloodstained butterfly. And Seven Deaths in the Cat's Eye. Oh, man. Uh, one of the people that shows up in this movie that totally blew my mind, of course, was Barbara Boucher, the legendary Barbara Boucher, who has a uncredited role as a party guest. She is breaking out her dance moves. Oh, man, she could do it. I think about her in uh, Milano Caliber 9. Like her big dance sequence is like a set, an entire set piece in that freaking movie. Mm-hmm. It's great. So, yeah, let's jump into this plot. We'll come back to some of the other key players in, in, this, uh, in this film as far as the production goes. But this movie, of course, opens with a murder. We get a, a lady named Dorothy, and um, she spilled some, some weird red paint of some sort on her throat just on her neck just on her neck and she has she's having an allergic reaction to it she's rolling around screaming no she's dying that's supposed to be the most brutal throat slashing ever captured on film uh, in the biggest bathroom i think known to man <laughs> yes it's like i don't know where the bathroom begins or ends and the master the master bedroom begins or ends it's just a giant place it's so much tile and mirrors. Yeah. Well, at least it's not carpeted. I don't, I don't, I don't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not carpeted. No, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. It's, it's very slick. <laughs> it's easy for cleaning up the blood. Right. Right. To me, the furniture, all the furnishings of this movie are almost a character in and of themselves, along with everybody else you just mentioned. Absolutely. This was definitely a using the the trendy styles of the time. This movie is like a pop art sensation. And the furniture is absolutely a part of that. <laughs> so so after Dorothy dies, um, we find out that she was the mother of Nancy, who we'll be getting to in a second. Uh, but her ex or now widowed uh, husband is Marco, and he is, we're going to call him Stepfather of the Year. He has never even met Nancy before because she's been off at boarding school. Maybe he saw, maybe he met her as a child. 
as a child. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But apparently paid no attention to her really. Right. And yeah. his lover is Rosalba Neri and, and she's uh, Gianna and she's a photographer who just moved in or was living there. Don't know how she was living there, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> right. The, the whole point of all of this fun time is an inheritance scheme. We love inheritance schemes in the old Giallo country. They need to spend the money that Nancy is going to get when she turns 18. So they need to kill her before she turns 18 or else Marco can't get the cash. At least that's how my brain is remembering it. And then, and then poor Gianna is just up a creek without a paddle because she's just kind of like living there on Dorothy's dime, basically. Yeah, which yeah. cracks me up because she has a profession. <laughs> she's a photographer. Yeah, like, go to work, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> You're already basically doing your job. You look like an expert. So, like, go photograph some shit. <laughs> go photograph a wedding. But anyway, <laughs> so so Nancy rolls up into town, and they're shocked by how mature she is. And she's given a tour of the house, specifically her dead mother's bedroom. You want to tell us about this interaction with Gianna? So, uh, like Richard said, they don't really remember this girl very well, even though apparently... Gianna was very good friends with Dorothy. So Nancy does show up and they end up in Dorothy, her deceased mother's bedroom. And Gianna's kind of showing Nancy the wardrobe. And then just within maybe five minutes of meeting her, talks her into taking her clothes off and trying on the mother's clothes. Um, and she's fine with this. Everyone involved is fine with this. It just seems so very awkward. But I do love that Nancy's kind of shy, so she turns away from Gianna as she's undressing, but she turns to face a full-size mirror. So <laughs> there's you know, nothing young. hidden. She's young. Yeah. She doesn't know how mirrors work. <laughs> <laughs> just so odd. <laughs> this is like one of my favorite moments right here. This is where Rosalba Neri just blew my mind. So as soon as... Nancy starts undressing. They do a really hard zoom in on Rosalba Neri's reaction to seeing this girl undress. Like she instantly is just, I'm going to go ahead and guess filled with lust. Rosalba Neri looks turned on. It's wild. It's like me with a pizza. It's me with my tacos I had for dinner tonight. Like, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I, I will be consuming that one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. While flirting with Nancy, uh, Gianna's like, you should totally be a model, bro. You're so hot. And so they have the mother of all fashion montages. Mark, would you please tell us oh, some, it's some of this? It's amazing. It's replete with Dorothy's wigs. So she's now donning her deceased mother's wigs. It's outside in some of the most bizarre fashion. There's one thing where I'm pretty sure she skinned like an Ewok. Yes. She just pops up in this fuzzy coat, and but with a straight face, which I'm like, no one could wear that in public with a straight face. And it just montage after. And the wigs are not really put on like, correctly sometimes oh but God. they're still snapping photos yeah <laughs> it's it's great i'm not in no way shape or form should anyone take what i'm saying is like a negative about this film because these are things that i find the most endearing about this movie i love all of this more than anything <laughs> like oh. i want to be nancy i want to be in that photo shoot with gianna like just wearing god awful wig after god awful wig you're like, yeah. I'm going to keep everything you let me try on. Oh, exactly. Yes. And it'd be better if I stole it and they didn't know that I took it. It would mean more to me that way. Yeah. So, And so, again, Richard, is this like maybe 10 minutes in? Like the girl yeah. hasn't really had a chance to like maybe go to the bathroom or like, you know, right. just take a nap from her travels. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like a time, photo montage. Time is compressed. Time is very compressed in those movies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Marco loves all of this. Marco is like, wow. Ha -ha. So they have schemes. These schemers are scheming. But Marco gets a little too into it and starts to 
immediately try to get Nancy to fall in love with him or something is happening. And he takes her on a boat and they have this wonderful lake scene. And this is where I love um, movie magic. And by movie magic, I mean hopelessly broken bullshit where (laughs) Nancy gets knocked into this lake and Marco either falls into or goes in after her. And they do this shot of the two of them splashing around in, I'm assuming, a swimming pool. And that's heated. It, that's heated. And, and they, or they just <laughs> pump in some freaking uh, smoke. I don't know what they were trying to hide. If they're trying to hide uh, the bottom of the pool. It's and, amazing. And it's darker. It's, it's like it's broad daylight. But oh, they, no. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it is not good it is so not good i love it but you know <laughs> we get we get some some malfeasance with some sleeping pills after she gets miraculously saved by some fishermen and then her and marco keep hanging out keep partying and then we have the marco boner moment where now we have a, another photo shoot with drunk nancy Tell us about this, this uh, totally so, messed up scene. Okay, okay. So I there's so many. So she's supposed to be very young, but it's like of age over, you know, in the you know in that country. But still, she's like very young. She's his stepdaughter, and he's all handsy. Um, and so they go down to basically Gianna's. What would you call it? Her like studio and then now nancy's like you you didn't capture the real me within that first 10 minutes when i arrived i I want you to capture the real me now you know like maybe like what 20 minutes into her visit so (laughs) she's set herself up so she's like juxtaposed next to the old photos and then she's doing this other one but then all of a sudden her clothes kind of like just come off yep and now she's nude in front of both of them marco and gianna it's very uncomfortable, and she's kind of coming on to her stepdad in front of Gianna. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> all I know is when I did this, I wasn't welcome back to the family union for like a good decade. Oh, see, they shouldn't judge you. Did, didn't they see this movie first? I uh, know. I'm like, oh. hey, the Italians are fine with this. Why can't you know people in Missouri <laughs> be okay with this? <laughs> Eventually, uh, Marco gives in to to nancy trying to seduce him and she starts playing everybody against each other um and, and of course meanwhile there's this mysterious character that's always just out of camera we don't know who he is we don't know what's going on we, you know we start to think that maybe this the person who's being schemed upon is also a schemer herself and they discover that she has a letter she supposedly has a letter that her mother sent her it is why she's there is why she showed up so suddenly through all kinds of conniving, they finally get a copy. They get to the letter, and Mar- Marco has one of my favorite lines in the movie. He re- he's reading this letter that supposedly Dorothy wrote, and he goes, You know, she must really have hated me to write a pile of crap like this. <laughs> Beautiful. Which I want to know what it said. I want, now I want. To, I wish we would have had those one of those scenes where they were oh put in the God. films where we get to read over someone's shoulder. Yeah, with, with Dorothy's voice reading us. It would have been amazing. Amazing, um, yes. And we, we do finally see what happened. We find out what you know actually occurred between Marco and Dorothy where they had this big fight and she was like, you have this fancy title from your family, but you have no money. That's why you married me, uh, you son of a bitch. Then she's taunting Gianna and... Unfortunately, she doesn't realize Gianna doesn't take such things, and Gianna kills her. Fast forward to now, where they have just convinced the police that Dorothy killed herself. And now, they're going to try to convince the police that Nancy killed herself. (laughs) They do this thing where, you know, locking the garage with the cars running, but... Gianna has decided that she's going to end up with Nancy. So she's going to go ahead and lock Marco in his own, his own trap that she helped him set up. And this was my other favorite scene where he's locked in the garage. 
with exhaust fans going blowing smoke in and the cars are going and he's locked in and yes he, he turns off the engines to save his life but then the he's still locked in and there's still smoke being pumped in from some rando you know mach- machine that pumps out like a generator yeah like a generator they hooked up there you go thank you i was like i wonder what the hell that was supposed to be he doesn't get in a car and just crash through the doors Thank you. Well, no. I was just yelling at the TV like, hey, moron. Same thing. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, God bless him. He's, he, he never <laughs> thought this would happen to him. Just He's just so distraught over every woman that he's ever loved turning against him. He just couldn't think to, like, you know, back out real hard against that garage door. Oh, man. Yeah. Sad state of affairs. <laughs> so <laughs> believing that Marco is dead, Nancy... And Gianna should be celebrating and, you know, getting her stories straight and everything. But uh, Gianna is surprised that uh, Nancy's uh, a little icy in her treatment of her. What happens there? So my, I love how you can tell that she's totally done a total like 180 because once she gets that cigarette, Nancy, like she's a different chick. Gianna's thinking, hey, you know, we're going to become lovers. We're probably going to spend all this cash and we'll just live happily ever after. But like Nancy quickly puts a kibosh on that. And Gianna goes to like touch her and she's like, take your hands off me. And then Gianna's like shocked. And she's like, nope, the gig is up. It's just me. And uh, you, you, you're getting no part of this because this was all a scheme. But the cigarette is like the real tip off. And she becomes a totally different person. Yeah. Amazingly, like right before your eyes, she transforms. I love it. I love it. So this is when we meet uh, Hiram Keller's character. Uh, again, we saw him earlier. He was Dorothy's lover. So Marco was sleeping with the much younger Gianna, but it looks to me like Dorothy was doing one better by sleeping with an even younger man. <laughs> we find out that he's this guy that Gianna has been like secretly meeting with. He's her pimp. Gianna is a the- prostitute. Uh, Nancy, Nancy. I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Nancy's a prostitute. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Rosalba would come and slap you if you said that about her. Hey, I mean sex worker, everybody. <laughs> sex worker. Right. My favorite line here that uh, Hiram Keller gets to say, he was mad about uh, Dorothy getting killed, and he says, And I don't like having my dish taken away from me while I'm eating. Right. <laughs> So I think you have it down pretty much exactly word for word what he said. So so he didn't love her. He just is his pride was her like, hey, don't murder that. (laughs) Well, I I guess she was his, uh, for lack of a better term, his his cash cow. Although she was a very fancy woman. She was not in any way a a, a cash cow to me. No. I love how she kind of she's like, uh, I'm old enough to be his mother. And I thought. M- mother or grand, grand, grand grandmother maybe uh <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah I, I like how delusional dorothy is with her with her choice of lovers hey hollywood men do it all the time it's it's why can't the ladies you know <laughs> oh yeah i'm fine with it but i'm like I, not his mother no dorothy not his mother uh yeah <laughs> Um, well, obviously, she has a very maternal instinct, you know, shipping her poor kid <laughs> off to boarding schools her entire life. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, even her closest friend, who was sleeping with her husband, didn't even recognize the girl. Like, that that's how much contact they had with the girl. They didn't even know what she looked like. I completely forgot about that character. Oh, my God. The housekeeper didn't realize that Nancy yes. wasn't Nancy. The best friend didn't realize, the the stepdad didn't realize. I mean, what a really crappy mom. Yeah, I didn't even mention Magda, the, the housekeeper. Uh, we mentioned oh. her earlier, but she is suspecting, she's like suspecting some shit's going down, but um, Marco and Gianna, you know, kill her. It ends up all being for nothing. So Marco isn't dead. Kiram got him out in time because he wants him to write him a check. With lots of zeros. Yeah, don't be stingy with the zeros. So that they can you know, live this, like, he and Nancy can live this lavish lifestyle. And, you know, once you pay a blackmailer, they'll never come back. That's always good. Uh, but he has a very incriminating cassette tape he made of Marco's, where Marco thought he was dying. He's like, I'm going to hold on to this tape, and uh, we'll see you later. 
and they ride off into the sunset laughing like, ha ha, we got them. And of course, the, my favorite laugh out loud moment is when they turn the corner out of the courtyard on the motorcycle, immediately tires screeching, crash. Tell me about this amazing finale here. So I also like how it, in the beginning of the film, there's also like in the same uh, driveway, there's almost a little car crash there. So there's the whole foreshadowing. And it's a little sidecar. So there's a motor motorcycle with, with the lover driving and then Nancy's the little sidecar, which by the way, Nancy has also helped herself to like clothing and stuff. And she's like, I'm going to take this, which kudos to her. I love the fact that she's just still robbing them blind. So they're in their sidecar and they basically hit crash into the taxi with the real Nancy arriving. Yes. This crash causes the tape recorder to start playing the confession made by Marco. So this poor girl has arrived to see her mom, who really doesn't care about her, but to uh, find two dead people who have basically blackmailed her stepfather and the woman who killed her mother. And she gets to hear about this all on tape while she stands there and looks <laughs> horrified, dressed like an orphan from Madeline. The children's <laughs> oh, my family. God. Yes. It's so good. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes. So that's pretty much the whole film. That That is like the, in a nutshell and, and hopefully not too painful for the audience nutshell to where you still want to watch the whole movie. Cause you know, obviously we skipped over a lot of stuff, but amazing stuff. Yes. Uh, fashionable, very fashionable stuff. Oh, so fashionable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so good. It's so good. So as far as trivia goes there, you know, there's not a lot, but, one of the things I'm really bad at is listening to audio commentaries. So the audio commentary that's on the Arrow video, I have not heard a word of it. I'm so bad about those things. Um, but I did watch some of the uh, interview with Silvio Amadio's son, who looks just like him. It is hilarious like how much he looks like his dad. But the trivia I got for, from it, um, one that... Silvio Amadio's son was very young. He was like five or six when he visited the set of this <laughs> film. And he was like, you know, he got to meet everybody and everything. Um, and they show a picture of him on set with like his sisters. And one of his sisters looks a lot like the real Nancy at the end of the film. So whoever played that the role doesn't have a speaking part. Nancy, I think maybe Silvio Amadio is like, Hey, daughter, go pretend you're this girl, please. I, I mean, that's just my theory. Interesting. I don't know. That might be solved by the commentary track. Because <laughs> I, I did watch that. I couldn't get the one you were talking about to work with. We were talking about earlier, but yeah, I yeah. did watch the other one. Um, I don't know if you want me to kind of go through stuff. Um, yeah, please. Whatever they were, saying, they were saying the year this came out was 72, and there were 33 uh, Gialli released that year. Oh, my God. Um, and for the longest time, this, the, the film here, Smile Before Death, was rarely seen outside of Italy because there was so much produced. It just didn't really have a, a wide release. And then, of course, this director also did a muck, um, which also had um, Rosalba Neri in it as well. Let's see. I don't want to go over stuff we've already talked about. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got this from earlier when we were talking about co the cosmopolitan gialli or sexy gialli. Um, where it mainly focuses on like a lot of nudity, depravity, and, and like sexual things as opposed to like the black club killer and things like that. Right. Um, it's mainly focused on like wealthy people. And and they kept referring to how the ending was, of, of this was very reminiscent of um, orga Orgasmo. Totally. And <laughs> this is not from the, the commentary, but I wanted to point out how Nancy because I had a coworker that would do this, but with the phone rings and she grabs something and then takes a bite of it and then answers the phone, which I never understood why people did that. Um, <laughs> Just to share their meal. Uh, right. I guess so. <laughs> um, and this is another thing. This is me and just my weirdness. So at the party, Gianni, uh, Gianna is wearing um, a series of like five star brooches. And there's like, they there's four of them that make a box and at the bottom there's a star brooch but then when she's killing dorothy the brooch is flipped and i just found that interesting uh, do with that what you will and then did you notice in the movie how um gianna's turtleneck uh sometimes is not the right way and sometimes it's halfway and sometimes it is the right way no i did not pick up on that at all 
Oh, Richard. Yeah, that just because I've watched this so many times. I'm like, you know, is, is that is there something more that we need to know about something going on with her sanity with her right. turtleneck? Is that like revealing her, her sanity? Oh. Um, no, I like it. There's a point in the movie where Nancy goes to meet up with her boyfriend slash pimp, whatever. And it's a it's a doll's house. It's called the doll's house. It's basically it looks like a toy store, yeah. but it has some of the weirdest, creepiest dolls ever. Totally creepy. Then just real quick, Nancy in this movie, her name is the same as the Nancy on uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. It's Nancy Thompson. Oh, wow. That's crazy. I can't believe I didn't notice that. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's really kind of all just the trivia that I kind of gained from the, um, well, I threw some things in, but uh, that I garnered from the uh, commentary for the most part. I like the it. only other thing is they mentioned that in Kill Baby Kill, it's Inspector Kruger. And they were like, is it just coincidence that like these Nightmare on Elm Street things kind of pop up from Giallo or was it like, <laughs> you know, Wes a fan somehow? Oh man, that'd be so, so cool. That'd be so cool. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the cinematographer on this was uh, Silvano Ippoliti. Um, he shot the, the greatest Giallo of all time, Caligula. <laughs> um, he shot um, some, some interesting stuff. He shot... Um, Spectre or Spectres from 87, which I've seen, but I don't remember very well. He also shot, oh, uh, he shot the Iguana with the Tongue of Fire. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And he also shot a movie I like, but it's almost too artsy to exist on this planet uh, called The Howl. Uh, before Tinto Brass would emphasize the ass in his name. <laughs> he made a little artsy movie. I mean, one called The Howl and another one right around the same time. It's really interesting. Uh, this guy also shot uh, Satanic from 1968. Have you seen that one, Mark? Satanic. Let me, because, uh, you know, I love all things Satanic. Uh, let me look it up. If you don't have it, I will send it to you. It is wild. I don't think it's pulling it up. Okay, let me hang on. What's it? Can you tell me what it's about? That, that may help oh, me. I'll read the, the IMDb to you. A withered okay. old hag turns into a beautiful young woman after drinking a youth formula, and then she has to go around killing to protect her secret. Oh, I don't know, Richard. It sounds like right up my alley. You will love it. It's the whole movie. That's the whole movie. <laughs> okay, I I love stuff like that. Very stylish. It's very 1968. So, so I oh, think. Oh, that's amazing. I really enjoy it. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Robert um, Frigadio, the composer, who I think that's his voice going, do, 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 do. That's probably not him. That's probably not him. Um, he mm -hmm. did the score for something that I love, which is actually my favorite Silvio Amadio film. In 1980, he was the composer on Ill Medium, uh, which I would love a Blu ray of Ill Medium. It's about. Um, uh, psychic premonitions. It's a giallo, a supernatural giallo, or a, a giallo film. And it is so good. And the copy I have looks okay. But man, it's just, oh, I love it. That's easily my favorite that, that Mr. Amadio lent his massive talent to. Uh, but this Where guy, are these things in our lives? I know. I know. Why do we have to wait? Seriously, for Richard. I know. I mean, this is a great time to be a movie collector, but we're still dealing with all this lost shit where it's like, okay, the person who had a copy that they actually were able to make a bad VHS of 30 or 40 years ago, what did that person do with that copy? <laughs> Put it in a freaking freezer, dude. I don't know what a movie geek you are, but I like to listen to like podcasts about like like Vinegar Syndrome and Severn Films. And like some people, they'll find these like in barns. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, people don't even take care of these things. And that's always oh. so heartbreaking to me as a movie lover. It's like, oh my gosh. It's I, it's, cool. it's, I'm so thankful for the work that some of these companies do just to get yeah. these films to us. Like people can't even keep the rights sorted out. Like there are people who don't even know they own movies. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Insane. This composer also did Death Carries a Cane which is just now, speaking of movies, I never thought I'd see a Blu-ray for. Death Carries a Cane just got a freaking Blu-ray. From? 
from Vinegar Syndrome. It's on the uh, part oh, six. Oh, the, okay. The Forgotten Gialli part six, I think. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I love those things. I don't have Godzilla bless those like people. Time. <laughs> same here. <laughs> yeah, same here. Yeah, I just I just start making a room of my Giallo box sets. So the, the yeah, actual room is the box sets. Build yeah. an addition on your house. I love it. Made of the box sets. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you have definitely shown through your words and actions that you love this film. Did you have um, anything else you wanted to add about uh, Smile Before Death to get people to watch it? Please, people. I can't. Oh, my only thing is I wish I could be there for people when they experienced it the first time because it is so much, I, it really is fun. Um, it's not your traditional black love killer. I don't even really think that there's a bottle of J&B in there. They were trying to say there was, but I'm like, I think that's wishful projecting on their part. But it's so much fun. It's got like, oh, the, the fashions I'm just like to die for. The furnishings, it's just on point. I just... Yeah. The characters so well cast. I love it all. And I don't really even think we touched on so many other things this movie has to offer. It, it, it's just a feast for the senses. It's amazing. And that song that they play again and again in so many different ways. It's, yes. it's, uh, it's a blessing. Nice. I, I, yeah, please, people, please now, cut this one down. I like this one. I, I wouldn't say I love this one. I'm, I definitely like it. I am a bigger fan of Amok, which crazily enough came out like two months before this. Yeah, same year. Yeah. It's and like and it was prolific. such a surprise hit, like right out of the gate, that they went ahead and greenlit Silvio Amadio to do another movie back to back. Hey, what else you got? I think it's incredible that he managed to pull this off in such a short succession of films. Um, but yeah, I, I lean more towards Amok. Um, this reminds me not as uncomfortable as orgasmo because orgasmo just makes me seethe with rage. Um, <laughs> and those characters just drive me fucking crazy. Then on the other hand, the other film this reminds me of is Oasis of fear, which has the, the oh, two yes. hippie kids driving somebody crazy. Mm-hmm. And which I love how those are both <laughs> Lindsay movies. <laughs> like, yeah, what? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Lindsay did both of those. There's no one likable in this cast. Please don't be, you know, yeah. be looking for maybe, maybe Magda, maybe like if you wanted to like hang your hat on someone, but exactly. there's no one likable in here, but yet they're no. so, <laughs> they're so watchable. Yeah. Um, the rest of the score that isn't that song. Now that song could be your favorite song of all time. I, I, I'm not going to judge people who like that song, but the school, oh. it introduces it in interesting ways where the composer is like, he slows down that yeah. and just ditches the vocals for a few moments and it gets really jazzy and smooth. And then all of a sudden it starts to pick up again. And then that girl, comes <laughs> in, bow, 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 bow. and then she does a cutesy laugh. And at the end of the movie, yeah, Keller's laugh over it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Insane. This movie is really horny. And oh, it, yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. The pop art stuff is crazy. The, the colors, the colors in this movie are why Blu-ray was invented. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Uh, there is a J&B sighting, but the labels always turned away from the camera. I, I wrote that down. And uh, Lietta had a comment. Um, she did not like Nancy's mullet. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you're going to know who I'm talking about, but to me, it looked very Christy McNichol. Of course. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. To me, it looked very Christy McNichol. Oh, uh, she probably beat her to the punch, right? Because I don't know if Christy McNichol, was she, she was, was she a thing in 72? Was she more of like a late seventies gal when her Probably hated. more late seventies. Yeah, yeah. 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 But then it, I automatically went to two moon junction with poor Christy McNichol. But yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's a smile before death. The movie, not the uh, the teleplay, as read by or, Norman Lear, <laughs> or the Marvel comic. <laughs> that's that's the Marvel method right there. Wow and wow. <laughs> so uh, before we go, I want you to tell us. Let me start that over. That didn't come out right at all. So before we go, I have a little segment that I love to do is to ask my my guest uh, and myself about one movie that you recently watched that you loved. Um, from any genre, it can be anything. Just what's the film that you 
recently enjoyed? So with me, I am a sucker for like cult movies, anything to do with Satan, stuff like that. Uh, And I got the Ray Dennis Steckler box set and I've been making my way through that. And I stumbled upon Cynthia, the devil's doll. And it's the most non Ray Dennis Steckler movie I've ever seen. Really? It's just so weird. Uh, are you like familiar at all with like a lot of his films or any? No, of I know films? of his work. I know of his work. I've seen like one or two. Okay. Yeah. But this one is so odd. You've got like color gels. Uh, you've got the lead actress, like giving it her all just chewing up scenery, overacting beyond belief. And, and like, I, this is all great to me. This is like my kind of jam. You've got people and I'm not making fun, but like, People delivering dialogue and with very thick accents, so you can barely understand what they're saying. Barely dressed cultists doing odd dances that really a cult member wouldn't be doing. It's just amazing. And then there's like a play with time where if Cynthia could go back and not dispose of her parents. She could like save herself. It's just so weird. And I love every minute of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just amazing. And it's only like 78 minutes long. It's great. Like, if I could live in this world, I would. Nice. It's amazing. Yeah. But what's well, yours, absolutely. Richard? I, I will absolutely check that yeah. out. That sounds crazy. Yeah, so I love stuff I, like this. I was going to pick a movie that I strongly enjoyed, but I don't necessarily re- recommend it. It's a little movie called Lover's Lane from 2000. It is a bad slasher. It is... A bad it, slasher, yes. It is not good. <laughs> and I... I don't know if I talk about it, people will watch it and then they'll be mad at me. Um, hopefully it has its fans. I mean, it has a great Blu-ray from Arrow that came out uh-huh. last year and everyone told me it was terrible, but I was like, I need more um, Valentine's Day movies. And so Liette and I watched it last night on Valentine's Day and we both really enjoyed it. But with that bewildered, holy shit, that's wow, that's bad. <laughs> So I'm cheating. I have a, a movie I really love that's actually good called Flesh and Fantasy from 1943. Now the title. Oh yeah, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, the title's very provocative. Very provocative. It is definitely not. There's not a lot of flesh, but there's plenty of fantasy. Uh, this is uh, a, a anthology film with some uh, loosely connected occult tales as. Uh, as IMDb is saying, very, very accurate, loosely connected. People like um, Edward G. Robinson and uh, Barbara Stanwyck is in it, and she's, of course, incredible. Robert Benchley, you know, this is just a great cast. And the reason we watched it recently was it has a Mardi Gras segment, and the, the first story is a Mardi Gras movie, a uh, Mardi Gras story. And so we watched it on Mardi Gras. But... It's 1943. It's classic Hollywood. Everything is shot beautifully. Everyone is giving their all. It's just a fine, fine film. I so, really enjoyed it. So I love the mask shop. I yeah. think that's, that's a really cool uh, Ooh, yeah. scene. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Yeah, uh, that's an awesome pick. Like a really awesome pick, Richard. Thank you. I, I'm yeah. really, really bad about old Hollywood. I'm really bad about... I When I was younger... Um, I had a cutoff date where I wouldn't, I just said, I don't like any movie older than 1960. And I don't know where I got that. I don't know. I, I, I used to watch Turner Classic Movies when I was a teenager, when it was new, and I didn't like it. I didn't like anything from the 30s. I just didn't, I didn't have the patience for old black and white movies. And I've cured that. I totally love old black and white movies now. I'm still like working up the excitement about silent films, silent films. I don't dislike them. I just still don't have the patience for them. So that's like mm-hmm. my, my last like thing I want to conquer is, is silent films and really good. I've seen some great ones obviously, but you know, it's a, this is a block, but yeah. So getting to some of these, you know, some of these movies that just have all this, this pedigree behind them. And it feels like coming home because when you've watched movies that were, the directors were inspired by these older films then you watch the originals and go, oh, you know, like, and it's not a, it's not even a tangible thing. It just feels like you're seeing the OG version of whatever you've watched for years. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. I do know what you mean. Yes. That's very cool. That's very cool. Now, can I go back to Lover's Lane real quick? 
please go back. I, 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 I feel like I shouldn't have said anything because I, I like I cheat and I pick two. <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm trying to get in my head. Is Lovers Lane the one that's kind of like urban legendy? Yes, the the artwork looks like the looks like the rip off of Urban Legend. Very okay. Much. They were definitely trying to make. Um, I know you did last summer. Scream and and gotcha. on one three hundredth of the budget. Right now, is there a scene where there's a couple on a motorcycle, or am I thinking of something else? And they mm. they're. I think I might be thinking of a different movie. And they wait for the train to go by no, no, no. because. Of, that is Death Screams. Okay, I'm mixing the two movies together. Okay, this, right, this thank is you. from 2000. This is um, maybe Anna Ferris's debut. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm just mashing the two together. I love Anna Ferris so much. Yes, you will <laughs> love her in this. It's interesting to oh, see. Oh, I've her. seen it. I've, okay. Yeah, I've seen. It. I'm just trying to. I've just that the other scene I was putting in that movie. If that makes any sense. So that's why I was asking about it. I've just stuck that scene in the other movie. It's really fun seeing Anna Ferris not have her shtick yet. There's one moment when she acts like the Anna Ferris we know. There's one moment where she kind of like does that. Oh, yeah. You know, you can hear her voice. I I can hear her voice in my head. (laughs) Because I watch May a lot. She's she's that vamp in in May, the, you know that freaking psychic vampire asshole uh, um, in that movie, and she's so good in May. I love her. I love horror because you get these thespians in horror that yep. like they're just kind of starting out or whatever. But and the people that have them don't really know what they've got, you know, starting out or whatever. And so they turn up in the weirdest movies, like uh, Grizzly Two. It's got like George Clooney and Laura Dern and, uh, oh, I, I'm drawing a blank, not uh, Emilio Estevez, but Charlie Sheen. But they're all murdered like in, in the first like 10 minutes. <laughs> because and, nobody knew who they were. No. Yeah. But I love horror for that very reason because oh, people okay. always just get into that to start with. Yeah. Excellent. But I digress and I apologize. Yeah. No, please. Well, we always digress on this show. I like both of your picks, Richard. I do need to say that I don't really recommend mine to anybody. But I love it so much. <laughs> See, that's why. That's why I said about Lovers Lane. You know. Yeah. But bef- before we really go this time, Mark, how can the folks at home find more? Mark, tell us about it. Well, gosh. Okay. So if you if you're not sick of me yet, uh, you can listen to my biweekly uh, podcast that I co-host with my friend Rob. It's called the Midnight Mass Creature Cast. Um, we cover mainly, um, if it's monster related, we try to cover that, but it, nice. by monster, it's a very broad net we've thrown out there. Um, and then I'm always lurking around on Instagram at Mark and a movie, and you have to put little underscores between all the words, but I'm, I basically set that up to talk about every film I watch. So if I've watched it, I cover it. I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's what I do with my life. Oh, it's great. That's how I found you. I was, I was like checking out your your instagram feed and it was freaking amazing then you started busting out the the fangorias like every issue of fangoria and i'm that's near and dear to my heart then i was like hold on you're podcasting well you got to do doom show you've got to come on the show so i was very excited that you were into it oh you have no idea how long i've been listening to your show and what a fan i am and your books too your books are amazing i can't say that enough well thank you and this yeah. was excellent. We'll absolutely have you back for real. This was a great well, time. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I had a blast. Uh, well, folks, go check out Mark's stuff, Midnight Creature Cast and Mark in a Movie. And uh, we will talk to you next time. <laughs> I forgot how to say goodbye <laughs> on my own show. <laughs> Bye, folks. Folks, thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to write into the show, send an email to doomedmoviethon at gmail, or hit us up at doomedmoviethon on Instagram, or at doomedmoviethon on Twitter, or at doomedmoviethon at Discord, 
or go to Hello This Is The Doom Show on Facebook and message us there. If you want more Hello This Is The Doom Show, go to doomedmoviethon.com and click the podcast button for the archive, or go to YouTube and look up Doomed Movie Thon and you'll find the classic episodes of Hello This Is The Doomed Show. And if that's still not enough, um, I have written some books, you know, about my love of movies over on Amazon.com. Uh, just look up Richard Glenn Schmidt and you'll find Giallo Meltdown, a Moviethon Diary, Giallo Meltdown 2, Cinema Somnambulist, or Doomed Movie 